He's a wonderful Savior, isn't he? Romans chapter 1, please. I'm going to use one verse as a text this morning. Romans chapter 1. One of the hottest, hottest topics of our day is, is evolution or creation. One might think in our enlightened society that we had learned the age-old tricks of Satan. If you remember that Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said, uh, you'll not die if you eat of that tree when God had said that you would. And can I tell you, from those 6,000 years ago, he's still lying today. He's the father of lies. Here is the lie he's perpetrating today found in Romans 1.25. Romans 1.25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Father, please help me now to honor you today. Speak to us and through us, I pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. To help me, just let me make sure things are, you, can you hear all right? Can everything all right? Tim, can you hear me in the back? All right, good. There are two courses in life you can take when it comes to the what we teach about creation. You can choose to believe the creator or you can believe to hear, believe what one of his creatures have said about him. I want to address this morning the importance, and I'm going very slow on purpose, and the benefits of believing in the creator. There's benefits of it. All of us have a choice to make. But I tell you that your choice will determine how you see life, how you live life, how you treat other people in life, and what you believe about creation. The atheist says <clears throat> that the universe is only an orderly accident. We're just here by accident. The agnostic says he is not sure how we come about. The theist, that's the word you are to learn, the theist, are those that believe that God started creation, but God stepped away from creation, and creation is running on its own now. And then there are those that we call us believers in creation. We literally believe that God created everything that's ever made upon this earth. I say without apology, I'm a creationist. I believe in creation. I believe in six literal 24-hour periods of time God created everything, and it appeared as it is, and he fashioned them by his son. And there's a question I always like to ask and not just skip over this point because it would be so easy for me to just jump into preaching this morning. Uh, someone has said, well, what about the appearance of age? Does the world, does it, is it four million years old, so many years of age? Well, here's, here's the thing about that is the answer to that. Here's the, here's the biblical answer to that. You can answer it yourself. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken came first. When God made Adam, did he make him a small little baby or did he make him a full-grown man? Made him a grand. When, when God made the trees, did he make them a seed in the ground or did he make them bearing fruit? He made them bearing fruit. So when God created the heavens and the earth, he made them with the appearance of age already. And he could have made it appear at any age he wanted it to appear. Billions of years of age if he so desired to do so. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But I believe that, he, that creation reveals to us the existence of God, the power of God, and the omnipresence of God in controlling everything. You know, that this complex universe should appear by accident because of a big bang is as probable as the works of Shakespeare resulting from an explosion in a printing factory. Can you imagine an explosion taking place at a junkyard and a Rolls Royce being left? That takes a lot of faith to believe that, honey. Only a God of power could create something out of nothing and then sustain it by his power and might. 
You say, what about scientific discovery? Well, scientists are over just only discovering what God's already made. They're not making anything. They're discovering what the sovereign God has already set in place. Paul affirms in Romans chapter 1, verse number 20, you're near there. The words be, scripture should be on the screen for you. You'll need your Bible this morning. We'll turn to two passages of scripture that will not be on the screen. Paul said, for the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. That's far as we'll read this morning. David sang about it in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his work. And the next verse says, day and day, day and day are the speech, and I do not acknowledge it, gives acknowledgement. Jesus himself did not hesitate to say this, but from the beginning of the creation of God made them male and female. Peter himself said in 2 Peter 3, 4, and saying, they said, scoffers, do where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. He mentions creation. In our text in Romans, in the context of our text in Romans, we know this from this. Contrary to what man is taught, here's what we've been taught. We come from a little old patch of stuffing in somewhere that we don't know where it came from. And we evolved through the years. We came in to be a tadpole, then a frog, and then a monkey with tails. And one day we were swinging through the trees and our tails broke off and we came a, had a PhD. That's funny. I shouldn't say that. I ought to just stay with, stay with the seriousness of, the, of this matter. We were there. And they say we started out and we started and we went upward. But the book of Romans said that man started at the top worshiping God and went down and started worshiping four feet of beasts, creeping things and fowls of the air. Men went down and down with down. And that's where we are in our society today. That's where we are today. The, 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 listen, the majority of scientists believe in creation. And I'm, not, and I'm not being unkind. I'm not being smart. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody. But our kids have been taught through the years through, 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 through systems controlled by our government that we came from a bunch of monkeys. And that's exactly why we act like we act. That's why we have no respect for life, no respect for authority, and no respect for one another whatsoever because we don't think we have a responsibility to a God who created us or to anyone else because we were made in monkeys and have no being in our life. What does God say about it? The Holy Spirit said this in Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, no God. Now our English Bible says there is no God, but literally the fool has said in his heart, no God. And it could be this, no God, you don't have your way, or you, no God, no God, no God, no God. Paul says this, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Peter states this about them. He said they are willingly ignorant. There's some people that will just not face the facts. They're willingly ignorant. You can show them the truth of it and they still will not believe it. Now, how does our, what, what benefit do we have as believers in believing about creation? What benefit? I want to give them to you from the Bible. I, I was reading this morning and in the morning I, I do several uh, 20 minutes of reading just for my own self myself that I start reading the Bible and read several chapters a day for my benefit. And the other day when I was reading, I came across this thought, and I want to share it with you. First of all, when you see creation as it is, you become to realize this, that we are owners of nothing, but we're stewards of what God's given us. See, when God made Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God created them, and after he created them, he said to Adam, he said, I have a garden here, I want you to till this. God made it. But God left it to Adam to till the ground and the soil. He became a steward of God's goodness and God's blessings. Now let me just get, can I get a witness this morning? Has God been good to you? And what God's given to you, even though they're here, they are temporal, but you become stewards of the good things that God has given you. He's entrusted us to a world of goods that we're stewards of that good. Now, hang on for a second. A lot of Baptists get so upset when a preacher wants us to talk about this stuff, but it's good for us. Listen to me. Did you know that God gave us guidelines to care for animals? You know that God gave us guidelines to care for a nesting bird, not to remove it from its mother's wings till it was at least nine days of age? Do you know that God gave us instructions concerning animals that plow in the field? 
And God gives instruction about newborn animals, about people, about plants, about trees. And he said, why don't you let your land rest one year occasionally for the good? So God cared enough about animal life and plant life and earth life to let us know how to handle it here because we're stewards of God's good. Now don't worry, I'm not going to be able to become a tree hugger. But I do believe this, I believe we ought to respect what God has given us and take care of it. That's why it probably every once in a while to remind us, why don't you quit your filthy littering and dirt in God's earth. Keep it clean. All right. Everybody smile now. Look out here, smile. I'm just saying it's God's earth. We need to, we need, come on, we need to take care, care of us. Is that not true? God, listen to me. If you want a blessing, I don't have time this morning. If you want a blessing, you ought to go home there and read Psalm 104. It tells you everything about creation, how God takes care of it, Psalm 104. So the first thing you'll do, if you believe in creation, you believe that you are a steward of God's gifts. The second thing. If you believe in creation, you benefit from the fact that you can have great confidence in prayer. Since our God, I'm going to give you a verse of scripture in a few minutes. Turn to Acts chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there. It may take you a minute to find that. Since God's the creator of this universe, he's our father. It's reasonable we should talk to him about things that concern us. Someone said prayer isn't, isn't prayer interfering with God's will. No, prayer is getting God's will done. Prayer is not me changing heaven's mind. Prayer is me seeing things as God sees them and me getting in step with God. Can I get an amen to that? He's the Lord and creator of all things. I want you to listen to what the psalmist said. Listen to this. He said, I will lift up mine eyes with his which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth creator. Listen to what Abraham said when the news came to him about uh, him defeating an enemy that's going to surround him. He said, is anything, God said to him, is anything too hard for the Lord? When Hezekiah was under attack of the enemies, the Sennacherib, which outnumbered him, and it seemed as if they were going to be destroyed because the enemy was so large. Listen, Hezekiah said this. He said, thou hast made heaven and earth, and, you can, and if you've made heaven and earth, Lord, you can take care of this enemy. Can I get an amen to that? Look at me in Acts chapter 4 now, just for a second. Acts chapter 4. I don't have time to read all of this, but the, the Christians have been beaten for their testimony for Jesus Christ. Watch what happens. Look with me at verse number 23. Acts 4, 23. In being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has, come on, help read it with me, which has what? Made heaven and earth and the sea and all them that is. He said, he said Lord, they've beaten us, they've mistreated us, but said, you're God, you created everything. And I want you to look, look at the response of when these people praise God through prayer. And when they were praising God, he's creator of all things. The Bible says in verse number 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. In other words, God said, wait a minute. He said, they, they were saying, praise God. He said, look what they've done to us. They mistreated us. They beat us. But said, God, you're Lord of all things. You made it all. You're in control of all things. And the Bible says there was an earth earth-shaking prayer took place and God shook the earth where they was and miracles took place because they dared to believe God in times of adversity and hard times. What's the benefit of it? Is, is this. When you focus in your prayer loft on the greatness of God, come on, help me. When you focus in your prayer loft on the greatness of God, what in the world is impossible? Come on. Is that not true? When you get the right focus of who God is, what in the world is impossible? And there's nothing. No, not everything we pray for lies in the will of God. But there's nothing that lays outside the omnipotence of God. Come on. Come on, say amen. Now, could, could God, could God, and the answer is yes if you don't know this, could God heal anyone that's sick of any disease? Now, that's God's will to do what he, he wishes to do. It's not because of God's weakness that God does not perform those things. We have a God who knows what's best, far better than we do. And he's here, he's in control of all things and it, can, it gives me confidence in my prayer life. Listen to me, this has helped me more than it ever helped you because when I saw this for myself, it helped me to pray better, it helped me to look at God better, it helped me look at my circumstances of life better and my Father is in charge of all things 
in his great power and his might. Here's the second, the next thing it'll do for you. Belief. What benefit is it? It'll help you when you're going through times of suffering. I want you to listen to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God come in the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful, tell me the word. He's a faithful creator. You're never going to leave this world without some suffering. Man born of woman's a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth as a flower and he's cut down. You're going to have him. But when we go through those times in suffering, we can commit everything to him because he is a faithful creator. The word commit there, we commit to him, the keeping of our souls, is a word to make a deposit. It's like you go down to the bank and you deposit something. You deposit your trust in him. Okay, Lord, I'm suffering. All right, Lord, things aren't good. All right, things are bad. But I'm going to deposit, to, I'm going to deposit this to you, Lord, and it's up to you, Lord. Yeah, I can't handle it, but you can. That's why 1 Peter 5, 7 says, come on, help me with it, casting all your care upon him because what? He careth for you. He can accomplish mighty things. I did not put this verse up there on particular, but I'm going to give you the reference. Psalm 147, verses 3 through 6. The Creator knows and numbers the names. He numbers every star. I was reading the other day, they, they, they've counted so many stars, they could see so many, 165,000 light years away, I think it was. How the world they even figure that, I don't even know. And they can't even give a number to all the stars. It's so massive. Yet God knows them all by name. Now, wait a minute. If a God like that knows all those things, does he not know everything about you? Does he know everything about your life? Does he not know every circumstances about you? Don't laugh at this, but he knows the hairs on your head. That's so assuring to me. I told you not to laugh. I can trust him. When Paul was writing, excuse me, when Timothy was writing these believers and he said they're going through fiery trials and they were, the Roman government was taking them and those Christians, listen, those Christians, they decided they were not going to say Caesar is Lord. They would say Christos is Lord, Christ is Lord. They said, well, if you don't say Caesar's Lord, we're going to throw you to the, to the we're going to put you in the arena and then we're going to feed you to the animals. They refused to, they were going through fiery trials through difficult times in their life, persecution for their faith. But I want to tell you something about the furnaces you go through in life. Here's the furnaces. Listen, I'm almost 70 years of age. I've lived long enough. I, I honestly, I've lived long enough to know this, that God controls the furnace. It controls the temperature. That's him. John F. Wade, who wrote a famous song, said this, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flames shall not hurt thee, I only design thy draw, draws to consume and thy goal to refine. That's why he did it. He wanted you to, oh, by the way, let me just chase a rabbit for a second, okay? And you, you know this truth because I've told you before, maybe you forgot it. Remember Malachi chapter 4, where Malachi says he, he shall set as a refiner. And what they did when they refined, it, when they refined silver, that the silver would be con contaminated because of the, of the material that was in it. And it, what happened, they would put it under a furnace of fire so that silver would literally boil. I remember when I used to work for plumbers when I was a young child growing up, and they used to use the caulking around with the old material they would use to put around the pipes, the sewer pipes. We used to do that. I'd watch that silver melt, and then I would take it out, and they'd pour it in the molds to keep the, keep the septics from leaking. And what they would do there, that, that refiner would get that fire heated so hot and every once in a while he'd get up and he'd look and he'd take a, something with an instrument. He would scoop the dross out and throw it away. He would sit as a refiner. He wouldn't stand. Every once in a while he'd have to get up to sit, but he would sit as a refiner. And how he knew when the silver was pure is when he got up and looked in it and he saw the reflection of his face. And God says, he sits as a refiner. The far away trials come. And God will reach in and take some dross out, 
some of the old dross out of our life, some of the old stuff, the old waste, the old junk out of our life. And then we see the reflection of himself in us. We've passed the test. Can I tell you, I failed some tests. Can I tell you, I've not passed all of them. But can I tell you, he sure is a wonderful Savior. Well, let me tell you what believing about the Creator will help you in your life. Next thing, it'll make you appreciate where you came from and you'll serve other people. I wish I had time, but I don't. In Acts 17, Paul is preaching on Mars Hill. He's going to tell the Athenians who think they're superior to anybody else, he's going to teach them something, he's going to shock them. He said, you, You've been created by God, you don't, God doesn't need anything from you. He said, and God has determined the bounds of the habitation of all of his creation. He said, because he's made of all of us one blood. He's made of us one blood. Now, those, those Athenians thought they were superior to anybody else. We're not akin to the barbarians. We're Athenians. We are superior to anybody else. And for Paul, dare to say they were one blood, how disdaining that was to be to them. May God help you and I to see this. We all come from Adam and Eve and from Noah and his family. And you can like this or you can dislike it. We're not better because of race. We're better because of grace. If we're better at all. The grace of God. One race. One blood. Here's a passage of scripture that's so powerful. What the word of God does for us. When we read and study God's word by belief of creation, I want you to listen to me what Psalm 119, 73 says. It'll probably be on the screen for you. Thy words have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. See, what we happen to believe here, and I believe this with all my heart, I believe at the moment of conception, life begins I want you to listen to the words of the psalmist they should be on the screen for you Psalm 119 139 13 for thou hast possessed me my reins thou hast covered me in my mother's womb for I, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and I'm wonderfully made marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well my substance, my fingers, my hands, my feet, everything, he said, was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth or of the womb, that word can be translated. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And thy book of all my members were written, which in continuous was fastened, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, when God conceived us, he saw every member of our body, what we would look like, would be like in the conception God saw us. We're fearfully and we're wonderfully made. Can I get an amen to that? I have a 2007 Ford Expedition that I drive. It's, it's a nice vehicle, got 100 and, about 140,000 miles on it. Did you know I'm still finding out today things about that car I had no idea. I had a button the other day and some Spanish dude came up on my board. I had no idea where I was, what I, I had no idea how many miles it was, I had no idea where I was going. I couldn't figure it out. I had to call on my grandkids. Said, Hit some buttons here and help this thing. I literally the other day, I had one of those smartphones and it's smarter than I am. Don't you hate a smartphone that's smarter than you are? I dialed this number, I answered it, and somebody come on the line speaking some language I don't know if I ever heard in my life. I couldn't talk back to him, I couldn't say anything. I just said, adios amigo, goodbye. <laughs> I had no idea. I was hoping that was close to being right. I, I'm just telling you, they're crazy, aren't they? But see, but God, if I take time to read the manual, who wants to read the manual? About a phone, though. Can I get an amen to that? You're supposed to just pick it up and answer it, right? But see, God has given us a manual how to live our lives. Come on. It's the book. And trying to live life without God's word 
is like trying to fly an airplane without lessons. You're going to crash. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. In this book, we see people that made mistakes and people that didn't. We learn from them. I need to go on. Here's, the, here's something, and this is, this is the last point, but I think it's probably the best point. When you believe in creation, you're not going to like what I'm going to say, so just, you don't have a thing to worry about. Now that may hurt some Baptists because they really like to worry. I mean, our favorite song is, Why I Pray When You Can Worry. And we just like to, we, you know, we, just, we like to worry. Sorry, rascals, we are. But I want you to listen now as we turn one passage of Scripture. This is another passage of Scripture. I want you to turn with Matthew chapter 6. Are you there? Let me know. Verse 25, please. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not your life more than meat and your body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither they reap. They don't even gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to your stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that Solomon, all of his glory, was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or where shall we be clothed? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought, for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I read this little poem that everyone's heard sometime in your life. It said this. First of all, he said, I have never seen a robin get ulcers. He said, I've never seen a rabbit having a nervous breakdown. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know. Why those anxious human beings are rushing and worrying so? And said the spirit to the robin, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. The providence of God to beforehand, beforehand see what I have need of. Do you know that God knew you'd be here this morning before you ever got here? You ever occur to you, nothing ever occurred to God? If God has the whole world in his hand, which he does, don't you think he can take care of you? Be still. Know that I'm God. Let me tell you what worry does. Worry robs you of today's help. If you're worried about tomorrow, you have no joy right now. Right? If you're sitting here right now thinking, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to have for lunch? Go home, get a piece of bread, some peanut butter and jelly, and have a fit. And thank God, you just ate more than 60% of the world had to eat. Right? Yeah. See, take no thought of Sufficient days the evil thereof. He says this. Let me tell you what worry cannot do. It cannot add to your stature. It doesn't make you any taller. If it do, I would not be overweight. I'd be under tall. I'd be six foot five. It does not add to, it does not add to your salary. I'd be rich if it did, would you? Is it add to your satisfaction? Is it add to your sanity? Why do you why worry? Why worry? Let me ask you a question. Is your soul secure this morning? Come on, answer me. Answer me. Not just the front row, everybody in the back. Here. Are your soul secure? Is it answer me? Yes, it is. He keeps his brother for God to get the verse of scripture in our soul skill this morning. He keeps it in his hand. Let me ask you a question. Is your strength enough to face today and what you face? Yes, it is. As my days, so shall my strength be. You got a need? I mean a need, not a want. 
Is my supply going to be enough? Is God going to take care of our uh, supporting all these missionaries? Is God going to take care of us for paying everything we need? Can I tell you this? My God shall supply all my need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen to that? My Savior has promised, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Let your conversation be without covetous. Be content with such things as you have, for he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Therefore, may we boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man will do unto me. There is no temptation taking you but such as common to man. And God is faithful. Every temptation, he'll make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Is my substance safe? Yes, it is, because I've laid up treasures in heaven where nothing can steal it, nothing can take you away with it. I've honored the Lord with my substance, first scripture I increase. My barn shall be filled with plenty. God will take care of me. Why in the world should I worry? I'm sorry, I just can't stop. I've got too much I want to say, and I want to get done. Will you let me get done? We'll be a few minutes late. Let me get done. Listen to this. Listen to this. Man, if you don't have this written down, you ought to mark your Bible with this. One. Listen to Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not. Neither is he weary. There's no search of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. Someone want to help me? Them that have no might, he increases his strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Help me now with the last part. But come on. But they that wait upon the Lord, what are they going to do? They're going to do what? Man up with the wings as eagles. They're going to do what? And where they're going to walk and not, not faint. He'll give you strength. One last thing. The matter of salvation. Creation. Belief in the matter of salvation. In Acts 14, Paul and Silas have come to a city to preach. And a man has got miraculously healed. When he gets healed, the people think, oh, the gods have come to us a likeness of men. And they want to do sacrifice to, to Paul and Silas. And they start offering sacrifices unto them. And I want you to listen to what Paul says to this heathen city that worships false gods. He doesn't start preaching to them. First, listen to me, listen to me. That's why when we have missionaries that go to places that's never heard of the gospel, they don't start with the gospel. They start with creation. They start teaching people the basis of creation, who God is first. You're never going to get people to get saved and who God is. Come on. That's what Paul does, this heathen nation. He says this, Acts 14, 13 through 15. Then the priest of Juniper which were before the city, brought oxen and garlands of the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Saul heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's therein. He made it. You turn to him. Allow me one more passage, and we'll give an invitation. One of these days, we're going to go to the, be in the presence of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Are you glad you're saved this morning? Amen. It's good to know Christ, isn't it? I want, you to t I want you to listen to the theme of the song. Here's the theme of the song we're going to sing in heaven. The Bible said we're going to sing a new song. Here's the theme of it. I want you to listen. I'm going to read it to you. It says this. When those beasts had given glory and honor... And thanks to him that sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, that's you and I, fall down before him that sit on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. And we cast their crowns before the throne saying, here's our song. He's rewarded us with crowns. There's five of them. We're not going to mention them. We take them off of our head. We come over to him. We cast the crowns in front of his feet. Here's what we're going to say. Thou art worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's what we're going to sing about when we get to heaven. First song we'll sing when we get there. It's about creation. I happen to believe it, and it sure has helped me. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.
you're going to get baptized this morning, go ahead and come and get ready. I want you to listen to me closely. We're not going to keep you long. We're going to, I'm going to encourage you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you ought to get saved this morning. He's the Creator. If you're going through some problems and you want to cast your care upon Him this morning, you can do it at your seat. Uh, it'd be good for you to come forward, find you a place to sit on the bench here somewhere. Let me ask you a question. If you're saved, you know it. Raise your hand and say amen with me. Raise, I'm not going to look back. Raise your hand and say amen with me. If you're glad you're saved, say amen. If you could not raise your hand, you know Christ lives in your heart. You're not sure if you die, you go to heaven. If you would like to trust the one who made you, who has a plan for you, and you are made by him and for him, you'd like to give your life to him this morning, I want to encourage you to come and someone will take God's word and show you how you can be saved, how you can know it.